great discussion. So, well, we're gonna take it further. Uh, we're gonna discuss triple versus staged EK. Uh, let's, uh, you know, revisit the debate. Clearly hasn't been answered. So, clearly there's no consensus on whether to stage or combine EK with cataract surgery in patients who present with cataracts and Fuchs or Bulliske. Uh, this is sort of uh, roughly what we have in clinical practice. You basically try and distinguish the causes of visual loss, cataract, FECD, or both. If you have significant fukes with no cataract, you go for EK alone, sorry. Um, if you have mild FECD with no uh, edema you can, and significant cataract, you can basically do a careful cataract surgery because the patient might not need an EK. Or if there's, the edema can be hard to detect, we'll revisit that in a bit. And if you have significant uh, edema with a significant cataract, of course, then the answer is clear, but we still have to figure out whether you wanna do a stage or a combined procedure. This study was published about 10 years ago already uh, by the Price Group. They, they compared 292 pseudofake DMX to 200 DMX or triple cases, and there was no difference in post-op vision, endothelial cell loss, uh, keeps moving up, complications at three to six months. So clearly showing us the path 10 years ago that triple's the way to go if it's possible. Uh, this uh, another uh, s uh, study published in 2020, small case numbers, actually found the endothelial cell loss at one year was significantly lower at 33% in pseudofake edemic versus 40% if you combine. Um, funny though, because the rebubbling rates were really low and they were comparable within two groups. So when I read the paper, I couldn't really find a reason why would there be a difference in endothelial cell loss. And here's what the actual paper says that your greater ethereal segment manipulation and post-op inflammation after combined surgery. That might explain significantly higher endothelial cell loss in triple compared to the DEMEC only group. Although the paper did not show a higher incidence of cystoid macular edema in one group compared to the other. So we really still don't know. Um, Marcus and Joel published this meta-analysis in Frontiers recently, basically looking at more than 11,000 eyes. There was rural research view, non-comparative, uh, showing that DEMEC uh, has a similar post-op complication rate compared to triple DEMEC, although the quality of evidence was low at six months post-operative review. Again, sort of, you know, a little bit uh, biased towards doing triple whenever possible. Um, Vito published his meta-analysis looking at five non-randomized studies, uh, low quality though, again showing that there's no evidence that there's a difference between both groups, uh, triple or, or staged, uh, in terms of rebubbling and primary graft failure. Sorry, my slides keep jumping. Um, they did say, however, there, uh, there's a need for randomized control trials to basically answer this definitively. So just looking at some of the factors that we'll consider in the next few slides, it's basically represent collective wisdom of some of the physicians that I've spoken uh, with over the past few weeks. Um, we definitely look at patient's age, and this has been discussed earlier, and Dr. Aldarius talked as well, you tend to preserve accommodation. There's no cutoff for age, but if you look at all the meta-analysis and all you know, small and large series, 50 is usually uh, the cutoff point. Um, you do reduce the risk of complications when you're doing stage procedure associated with cataract surgery in young patients, and there's no doubt that most of these you know, younger patients, they're, they're, they're quite fit for those extra anesthesia extra trip to the OR and hospital visits, although you don't want to do that. Severity of endothelial dystrophy, of course, there's a limited view for cataract surgery. You know, all of us have, have sort of uh, started the triple procedure after and realized in like 20 seconds, oh my goodness, this view is quite different from what it looked on strip lamp. And of course, we've discussed in detail the challenges in IOL power calculation. And you, from time to time, you keep on getting these patients uh, who end up with uh, hyperopic surprise. Uh, even if it's uh, plus one, the patients are clearly unhappy. Patient preference is a big deal, but I have seen at least in some practices, uh, even here in India, uh, it is very important, but very likely depends on how they are made to perceive it. So there are physicians in, in our own group who will say, well, stage is the way to go. And there are physicians in the same group uh, who will say, well, I only do triples. So it's funny if a patient comes back to you and says, well, you know, I met that person and you work in the same department, you're basically doing, saying the op completely opposite things. Some patients do demand hematropia, you know, uh, even if they have to use reading glasses. And you really have to figure out that you always have to tell the patient that if you have early fugues and, you know, somebody, you're looking at somebody at 65 with corneal thickness of 500 something, they might never need an EK, depending on how bad the fugues is. 
Uh, this study basically looked at 86 eyes with, with uh, the neck triple. This is from Wilmer, uh, our own friend Divya published this. The mean error of refractive error ranged from uh, minus 0.1 with plus point, or plus 0.9 with using Barrett's. So they tried to aim for minus one. So you've got to counsel the patients for refractive inac inaccuracies uh, when you're doing combined uh, um, procedure. Financial factors, uh, not really discussed uh, in the United States many times, but this is real data, you know, Medicare claims analysis, again from, from Wilmer, it's more than 700,000 eyes um, with tubes dystrophy, 4.7% received keratoplasty, at least in this cohort. And only 2.4% of eyes with cataract surgery actually received EK in this uh, analysis. So it is not a bad idea sometimes to sort of uh, offer only cataract in such patients. Again, conflicting evidence. Practice referral patterns, very important. You know, no matter where you are, um, unless you're in a very small, you know, sort of city or town where you probably the main provider um, and, you know, it depends on what kind of patients you see, what are the outcomes, what are they being referred for. Uh, it also depends a lot on not only your surgical expertise and experience of the surgeon, but also the surgical technique. You know, all of us sitting here probably have a slight nuance about doing EKs, uh, technique, how you rebubble, how you bubble, whether you use 100% air, whether you use SF6 and all that stuff. It, it, you know, there's, there's a lot of variation there. <coughs> I want to revisit this quickly. In cases where it's hard to detect subclinical edema, we have sort of tried to use uh, Sanjay Patel's, uh, you know, uh, formula for looking at the pentacam. We all know that there are four, uh, you know, signs in pentacam, displacement of tennis point of cornea, loss of parallel isopacks. <coughs> sorry, three, I, I meant, sorry. And focal area of posterior uh, surface depression. So if you look at this uh, sort of protocol that has been published in ophthalmology, if you have fuchs with subclinical edema and your patient shows um, uh, features of clonal edema, uh, frequently all three or typically at least two, you can basically, uh, you know, uh, well you can't be sure, but you can basically tell the patient accordingly that you might need uh, EK at a later stage and it might help you to a certain extent to make a clinical decision. Uh, EK first, of course, you can stage it in a way where it's EK first, we've discussed this briefly. Um, it, sometimes this is a difficult decision, not in very young patients though. It improves the accuracy of IOL power calculation. I think that's one of the most important advantages of doing EK first. And it facilitates the placement of toric IOL or press barrier correcting IOL or even LALs. There's always an inherent risk of graft attachment and endothelial cell loss and eventually leading to failure. So important to tell the patient, inform them properly before you go ahead. Um, this is a paper, um, basically uh, from uh, Melly's group and looking at fakies and pseudofakies eyes with fuchs as they had similar BCVA uh, and e endothelial cell loss and rebubbling at six months. 17% uh, of uh, cataract surgery aid in fake edemic at five years. So EK first might be preferable for young patients with residual accommodation as we discussed earlier. Um, previous paper from uh, uh, Price's group stage procedure with EK first uh, had 16 eyes that received premium IOLs uh, and with had, which had, um, all patients had actually good results, uh, 2025 with distance acuity and near was 2020. So just to conclude, well, I hope this is, these are the conclusions. Young patients, you can do stage with EK first. Uh, we have early EK cases, you can use uh, those uh, uh, parameters on Pentacam. Uh, you can do stage with, with cataract first. Uh, surgeon experience, well, it depends, I, I always look at if you speak to, with someone and say, well, I'm experienced enough to do a triple procedure, I won't have any issues, and somebody else might say, well, I'm experienced enough to do an EK first and then take care of my patients in a better way, giving them 2020 or 2015 vision. Patient preference, you, as I said, it really depends on how you are leading the discussion. Stage can be as good as triple, and financial considerations definitely, definitely, as, as Tony said earlier, um, 95 to almost 100% of my patients who are more than 60 or so have some cataract I'll go ahead and offer them triple instead of stage for because of financial considerations as well. Thank you very much for your attention. Very nice presentation. I want to give you a hypothetical patient and see what how you'd manage this patient. Um, let's say somebody who's 60 years old, central corneal pachymetry 600, um, no epithelial edema, no stromal edema visible on exam, but on pentacam imaging has displacement at the thinnest point 
has loss of parallel isopacks and has posterior displacement of the posterior corneal profile. Um, and is not happy with their vision. Do you do cataract surgery alone or do you do cataract surgery with DMEC in that patient? Or what other, what other factors like cell count to posterior corneal fibrosis, what other things go into that decision making process? Yeah. Am I, am I practicing in India? I'm just joking. <laughs> Let's do in India first <laughs> and then in Pittsburgh second. <laughs> no. So the short answer is I'll offer triple, like straightforward answer. 60 years old, has some cataract. Eventually they would need cataract. So really straightforward answer. Um, but why do the graft if there's no stromal edema evident on exam? So I was going to come to that. Okay. So I, I do look at the, the amount of gute, you know, the density in the center, the quality of vision, night vision. So there are patients in my practice who are, who present with 20, 30, 20, 25 with grade one to grade two necrosclerosis and Fuchs dystrophy. Um, you do basically a triple procedure, they end up at the same level, 20, 25, 20, 30, a lot happier because the visual quality improves a lot. Something that I didn't mention, and I've sort of started collecting data only since last year, I do look at the family history as well. I ask them, you know, when did your mother need transplant surgery, you know, uh, and how strong is the family history? How many people had transplants? And this is not going back 30 years when everyone was doing PKs and stuff for Fuchs, or people were getting pseudophagic bullus when Fuchs was undetected and they had cataract surgery in a bad way. Um, so I do consider that as well, you know, to a certain extent. But I think quality of vision um, is important for my patient as well. I mean, clearly, we, you know, we are not there yet in terms of evaluating these patients, I think, preoperatively. Uh, Joe did publish a paper some time ago where you were looking at quantification of Gute, just looking at the slit lamp pictures. I think I, we, we do that in clinical practice, although we are unable to quantify those, but you can basically see how the Gute are basically, you know, how dense they are and are they widespread or not. So. Are you using the microphone? So what we're doing now is, and you, you, you can finish your paper on this now, is that we're looking at yet to answer Tony's question. So I see a lot of patients sometimes that have, um, they may have slight abnormality on posterior referral like Sanjay basically showed. Actually, may some have may no abnormality, but they have this fibrotic scar on decimate. So we're actually now using densitometry because I realized from that paper that the problem was is that we have a very good photographer. And when I asked them, lots of people started sending me images saying, God, can you quantify it? But the quality was so poor. I was like, okay, uh, this is not going to be practical. So then we thought, okay, is there another way we can look at this? And actually what we're doing now is on the Pentacam, you can pull up densitometry and you can adjust your posterior densitometry to be about, so it's preset, I think it's 60 microns from the back at 120 at the front. And you can adjust the posterior one to be 30 microns away from decimase membrane. It's just a scale bar, it's very simple to do. And that actually gives you a very good idea hmm. of basically backscatter for the patients as well. And if they have high levels of densitometry abnormality, then I will do basically a triple as opposed to basically doing a primary procedure. And I noticed there were a lot of patients that didn't have an abnormal posterior flow that had high levels of dens densitometry scarring. And that basically affects my decision making. Huh. And how do you make that adjustment? Just go in the Pentacam and just yeah. adjust from yeah, yeah. posterior 60 you, to yeah. posterior So you 30. just pull up the densitometry screen on the Pentacam, and it, there's, a, there's an automatic set of like 120 from the front, 60 at the back, and you just basically push the scale bar down. So you can just say, put it in at 30, or I chose 30 as an arbitrary figure, and we basically put 30, and then we compare 30 to 60 values as well. And I just use 30, 30 is pretty accurate, and it will really give you a good idea. Then just suddenly you'll see the screen will change, and then it will be, and then if you put the cursor over the densitometry map, it will tell you the actual value from there itself. Huh. So, so you can get the main value in the zones as well, three zones. So. Right. Yeah, yeah, Jeff, I, thank you. I just want to extend the question that you asked. If the first time has developed, say, the steroid induced glaucoma in the skin phase of the patient back, will you still do the cataract surgery alone or will you do the triple surgery? Sorry, what I didn't hear you. First time, sorry. Suppose this is the second eye, uh -huh. and the first eye had uh, steroid induced glaucoma in the first eye. So you did then the first eye. He wants eye. to know if you're going to do a DSO <laughs> instead. <laughs> <laughs> you did the first eye, huh? Yeah. No, no. Yeah, I, I don't think that's going to that's gonna impact my decision if the patient has steroid induced glaucoma in the first eye. I mean, that's a whole lot different discussion of why the patient developed that and how often do you, how quickly you taper of the steroids. 
But wouldn't that push you towards thinking about a DSO? Thinking I I'd like to address their hoops without the need for long-term Of long course, term it insurance? depends where the, the good they are. I'm not a big fan of DSO, I, I have <laughs> to say that. So uh, it would okay. not. Does your partner know this? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to tell Dee. Do, does this. your work partner know that? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, not a big fan of DSO. I'd rather put a, a tin graph there, you know, so it might last longer. Understood. Well, thank you very much for a thank great you. presentation. Thank you.